And I'll let guys in as we get going. We got live Facebook Live on Twitter. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Pete Caliendo, Baseball Outside the Box. Another show today, and we are excited to have Ernie Young, former Olympian, 2000 Olympics, um, gold medal. And we are about to start, but before we do, don't forget, this is a show that loves to interview baseball's best coaching minds who love the challenge of status quo. We are on live on Twitter. Thanks for joining us. Also, Zoom and, all, and Facebook Live. Um, and as I told you, Ernie Young is on the show, and he has done so much in the game. Currently a scout with the New York Mets. He's a pro scout. He's got the big leagues and the minors that he's covering. But he's also managed Team USA. He's on the, on the, uh, the advisory board for USA Baseball. He managed Team USA in the Pan Am Games and the World Cup. He coached in the minors. He's a hitting coach. Um, he's done a lot in the game. So let's get started. Let's not even waste any time. Let me follow <laughs> a good friend from Chicago who happened to – take off and go to Arizona and left us. What's up, Ernie? <laughs> How you doing today? I'm doing all right, man. And I forgot to mention my partner in South Africa and uh, Vancouver doing coaching clinics around the world with ISG. And we want to thank you, Ernie, for doing that. It's always having uh, somebody like you with us, uh, you know, educating coaches worldwide. No, uh, for sure. I mean, that's, that's the only way we're going to be able to grow our game is through, uh, through teaching and, and however I can do that and help that, that's that's what's important for me. To, I love seeing kids play baseball, and I love seeing kids play baseball the correct way. And guys and gals, we're going to get the questions even live on Facebook. Um, you know, Ernie, the other thing, I want to give kudos to USA Baseball. In the last, I want to say, 10 years, eh, five to eight years, they've done a – I know you're on the board of uh, – you serve on the board of USA Baseball. They've done a tremendous job of promoting the game, but also promoting coaches' education. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's that's been a big thing with USA Baseball is is trying to educate our coaches on the game, on and off the field, um, especially uh, this day and age where you know you have to be you have to be really really careful in some of the things that you say and some of the things that you do in regards to uh, kids, and we have to be we have to do our due diligence and and teaching and to help other coaches to, to not to put themselves in, in, a, in a bad situation. Absolutely. Hey, I want to get started. And again, any questions? And some of you guys, you know, we're going to have guys on. If you want to unmute your mic, let me know. Uh, and you can ask questions to Ernie. But let's get started with, you know, I'm always fascinated because I've known you for a while now. And, you know, you know I always tell people, one, you're pretty tough mentally. You could tell. You've, uh, you've been through a lot. You grew up in Chicago. Talk about, you know, how you grew up and some of the things that helped you progress. I mean, you made it all the way big leagues as a player, then a coach, you know, then Team USA managing. I mean, there's some big time things there. Talk about your journey a little bit there. Uh, growing up in, uh, in the city on the south side of Chicago, um, just my mom was a, a big, big factor in my career, you know, pushing me. You know, I knew that you know, from early on, that's what I wanted to do uh, was play baseball. And, and she allowed me to, to do that and play and, and work towards my goal. I mean, I, you know, single mom, father passed when I was four years old. So that was difficult in, in mm. its own. And, you know, just her and, and the rest of my family just helping and, you know, walking me to the park so I can practice or, you know, coming to my games when mom couldn't be there. You know, that was, that was my, you know, that was my life. I mean, I love the base. I love the game of baseball. I, there wasn't a player uh, that I didn't know from, you know, you know, some of the, some of the White Sox guys from, you know, Lamar Johnson and, 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 or, or even as far as with the Cubs with Jody Davis. I mean, I knew everybody. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of funny because now, that's the only kind of games that are on TV, you know, some of the older you know, <laughs> games. So I'm on and my, my, uh, my wife goes, uh, oh, what year is that? Oh, it's the 1984 All-Star game. So like, how do you know that? I was like, I don't know, because I'm looking at the players playing. Sandberg's at second base and, you know, you got, you know, you just have just the certain guys that you, that you follow. Um, and that's what, that's what attracted me to baseball was, was guys like that. And, you know, being determined, you know, to succeed 
and and focused. So growing up on the south side of Chicago, that was that was my way. I said, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, I went to an all boys Catholic high school, then I went to a Catholic college. You know, I, you know, I, I make fun of, uh, well, not make fun, but I, my son, you know, riding in the car with him and a buddy of mine to a uh, Phoenix Suns basketball game, and my buddy asked my son, "Oh, what's your, um, you know, what's your plan B, you know, in life?" He said, "Well, you know." I want to. I want to play professional. I want to play in the major leagues. Um, if if not, then I'm going to be. I'm going to be an agent, or I'm going to be. You know, I'm going to do something in baseball, front office, or something. And then I started to think. I was like, man, I didn't have a plan B. My plan A, B, and C was to make it to the major leagues. That was it. I, that's the only plan I had. So, you know, just just listening to my son say that, you know, kind of made me think back. Wow, that wasn't a that wasn't a very good plan I had to, you know, try to make it to the major leagues since only, you know, less than less than five percent of players that are drafted make it to the major leagues. It's extremely hard to make it to the major leagues. Absolutely. You know, and you know, you mentioned moms, you know, how many stories you hear about what moms have been to help their kids, you know, you know, just get a better life, you know, get a career in whatever whether it be in sports or anywhere else. Um now, were you a multi-sport athlete? In high school, I played uh, basketball and baseball. So I played freshman and sophomore year in basketball, as well as baseball. And then I decided that, you know, baseball was probably um, a little bit better for me. And I decided to, to concentrate more on, on the baseball side of it than, than any other sport. So, but... You know, as far as being a two-sport athlete, yes, I loved, you know, playing basketball. I didn't play football. My mom wouldn't let me play football. I wanted to, but she she feared that I would get injured and not be able to play baseball. So she put the put the kibosh on, on uh, me trying to play uh, football. Ernie, what were some of the challenges as you're, as you're going through – the different levels, whether, you know, like you said, you went to high school, college, what were some of the challenges of the sport that you had to overcome to make yourself better? Uh, you know what, living in Chicago was a challenge in itself. I mean, you know, I made the, I made the decision that if this was going to be a career for me, that I had to get somewhere where I was going to be able to, to work out and practice year, year round. I know, I know it's a little different now, than it was in the, I mean, I'm talking about the very early 90s, 1990, when I got drafted. So in 1990 or 91 or even 92 into 93, there wasn't many uh, facilities that cater to baseball players where they can get a workout, uh, get batting, you know, fielding, throwing or whatever. And that was, that was tough then. So I decided to, 1993, I decided to move to Arizona and, and live and, and make a career out of it. You know, you look at what's going on now, you know, players can go to, you know, to the Bow Dome in Chicago. There's all types of places that they can get, a, you know, get their, their workout and work on their trade. And we didn't have that then. So, I mean, the, the facilities are much better for the kids now. And there's really the only excuse that they have now is how much they want to work or not work. You know, you've got a son who's playing, sounds like a pretty good one. And you're, you're close with him. You guys work out together. You know, he's got also a, a, a you know, trainer. Um, you know, I, what's your advice to coaches when they're working with players? Because you always hear, work on your strength, but yet you need to work on your weakness also. Sometimes you can't work on both. Um, what's your advice there? I, I would say, you know, develop a plan and then try to, try to stick with that plan. So if, if week one you want to work on, you know, you want to work on, on staying up the middle or working on balls away. So you, you, you do drills that are going to allow you to, to accomplish that. And then you – I don't like jumping from drill to drill. I'm, I like to kind of get a drill, 
almost master it to a certain degree. And that's how you're going to continue to get better. And then, you know, the next week or, you know, a few days later, you know, you, you introduce another drill and, and go from there because if you keep throwing out, for me, if you keep throwing out more information or too much information, then it's going to be uh, difficult for a young player to uh, retain the information. So, so you have to be very careful in how you uh, how you deliver uh, the message to your to your young player. Because if you give them too much, then they're going to be overloaded and they're going to be more confused than um, than ever before. Absolutely. Hey, I got. I'm looking here. Patrick from Switzerland, and this reminds me of when you and I grew up. You know, I used to have the baseball cards with and put them in the spikes of the of the bike. Yep. yep. I wish I I wish I'd have kept some of those instead of ruining on the spikes. Yeah, tell me about it. I've been able to sell them right now when I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs> but Patrick says he he's from Switzerland. He had you on his fantasy baseball team. Oh <laughs> my! It. You gotta love that one. <laughs> hey Ernie, the game throws a lot of failure at us. Um, uh, you know, and I know you've been through some. Talk about how you dealt with it. Whether when you're in high school at the big leagues, you know. Because, you know, it's easy to give up sometimes and say, forget it. I'm going to do something else. You know, I mean, this is a sport, you know, built around failure. I mean, three out of ten or, you know, that's that's really good. So you're going to have to figure out how you're going to you're going to deal with the failure. So I'm I'm big and I try to stress with my kids and my son in particular is, is you know, learning how to to deal with that failure, not showing you know, poor body language, because what's going to happen is as soon as you show very poor body language, then, you know, someone else is going to see it. And even if you don't like the way that you took a swing and practice, you know what, let it go, learn how to let it go and get the next one, because it's always going to be the next pitch, the next play. It's going to be something next. And you have to be able to turn the page. Uh, and then in, once in the big leagues, I mean, which is even tougher, once you get to the big leagues, I mean, your failure rate goes even higher unless, mm -hmm. you're, one of, unless you're one of the top, top players. And that so you're, you're living. Top, you're right. making a living. That's your living you're doing. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, and you, even, if, even if you're one of the top players, you know, you're talking about, you know, if you're a hitter, you're talking about top player, you're talking about 28% of the time you're going you're gonna to get a hit. And if you're – you know, the Tony Gwynn or the Kirby Puckett. Now you're, you're talking at, you know, 34, 35% of the time you're going to get a hit. And then those other times you're going to get a walk. So, you know, the best advice I got when I first came up was uh, from Mark McGuire. And he told me to don't read the local newspaper. <laughs> Matter of fact, I stopped doing that a week ago. And I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> Good advice. Um, don't read the local paper because if you read the local paper, you you'll find either find out just how good you are or just how bad you are <laughs> in, in the same sentence. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, uh, you know we, our friends from South Africa say hi. Um, they're online also on. Oh, Facebook. tell them hi. Yeah, they're they they could hear you. Um, what about a routine Ernie had? You know, do you have some kind of routine when when things were going bad? You know, whether you made an error in the field or whether. You, you swung at a bad pitch. Was there a routine you used to kind of convince you, you know, to remind you, hey, forget this? Or is it just you just told yourself, hey, forget it. Like you said, it's worry about the next pitch. So for me, like you, you do all your training, you do your batting in the cage, and you work on your, your game. You know, you try and, you know, perfect your, you know, your approach or your, you know, you're working, keeping your hands inside the ball. You you do all that stuff. So when the game starts, you know, you don't want to be thinking about, okay, where are my hands? Okay, how are my feet? You know, am I, am I flying open? Or, you know, if I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So what I try to, what I try to tell myself and what I try to tell, you know, some of the kids that I work with, you know what, keep it simple. So think about one thing that, that can get you back into the moment. And that's, and that's what's more important is trying to stay in the moment, mm. you know? So for me, when I was playing, I would get in trouble when I would collapse on my backside, meaning that, you know, uh, my, my legs would, I would be underneath the baseball, you know, and I would tell myself, I would step out and I would say, Hey, 
you have to stay tall to hit the ball. And I, would, and I would try and keep it as simple as that because I didn't want to think about anything else. And that, that helped me, you know, and I think it's just keeping it simple, you know, not trying to, you know, coaches, you know, please, you know, try not to coach from third base to tell the kids, you know, hey, keep your hands up or, you know, you're not loading, you know, or you're doing this, you're doing that. You know, maybe, maybe say, hey, get ready on time, be aggressive. You know, keep it keep it as simple as possible, and that might trigger something for your for your kid or your, you know, whoever you're you're trying to coach. And guys and gals, we're going to get to some managing and coaching uh, discussions here too, uh, but I do want to ask. You know, interesting. You're coming from an era of not as much technology when you played. Now we got all kinds of technology. Are you using it? How are you using it? Just some advice. And I realize different levels, you know, like we were talking yesterday, high school coaches, and sometimes they can't afford some of the technology for the youth coaches, but are you using it? And what's the best way to kind of balance that? I mean, you, you need to figure out what's best for your kid. And I'm, I mean, I, it took me a while to get on board with some of the technology, but I, I understand that the times are different and you have to evolve. So, I'm, I'm in on the technology to a certain degree. I think you, you know, what hasn't changed is, you know, they're just putting numbers to it. I mean, you know, if you look at, you know, when Paul Mahler would hit, you know, he had a short swing, but extremely fast hands. And I'm sure the ball came off the bat at a certain mile per hour when he hit it hard. And the same thing would say a guy like Dave Winfield. Mm -hmm. So they're just putting numbers to it. They're just putting, you know, your exit velocity on, on this is, you know, 95 to 100, you know. And, you know, Ken Gri we all know Ken Griffey Jr.'s swing. It has some loft to it, you know. And now they're, now they're putting a, a, a label on it saying that it's called launch angle. And, yeah, uh, right. You know, so it's, it's the same. They just, they just put in terms to it. You know, Barry Bonds, same thing. You know, guys like that, McGuire, you know, in, in order to hit – in order to hit a ball out of the ballpark, you're going to have to have some type of uh, upward swing. You're not going to swing. You're not going to technically swing down on the ball in order to hit the ball out of the ballpark. But you know they're putting they're putting names to it. But but what they're but what's happening is I think sometimes when you you try to uh, distribute the information and they're telling you okay to elevate now, it's it's one thing to elevate in front of the plate opposed to behind home plate, which makes mm -hmm. your swing uh, long and loopy. You know, interesting. And I, I love the part that you talked about. You know, we're kind of reinventing the wheel a lot of times. There are some new things that come up, but, you know, Ted Williams talked about that a long time ago, right? The, the yep. ankles of the bat going up. You know, everybody yep. thought he was crazy. Yep. Um, you know, now everybody's talking about it. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm also concerned sometimes – and I know it's social media, but I'm concerned because, you know, I, I read it and I see, you know, like the other day I saw, it was two sentences on hitting, about rotation, and I'm an average person. I went to college. I mean, I, I think I understand some words, but out of two sentences, I think I understood four words. <laughs> because I don't know if people are trying to impress everybody, but why, you know, and I think that's what you're saying. Keep it simple. Yeah. Make it yeah. so complicated. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to hit, you know, hit the baseball and then you, and then you throw in, you know, you know, rotational and then you're linear and then you're, you know, this. So, I mean, for me, you know, and everybody learns at a, a different pace. So you have to be able to, the technology is great. And I, and I, like I said, I've started to adapt a little bit more for the technology, but you have to teach hitting depending on the level of, of hitter that you have. Some guys, I mean, even right now, some guys that I, I teach hitting to, they're, they're more visual. So I have to show them, you mm -hmm. know, some, some hitters I can, I can talk, talk to them and they can process what I'm saying really quickly and then they can do it. So, I mean, every hitter is different. You know, you may have answered this already, but your buddy, our, our good friend, Jim Salter from Vancouver, I think he drove you around. 
Yeah. Um, uh, he says, was there ever a time you just wanted to give up, you know, as you're playing them, uh, I think he means, mm -hmm. what, what, what was good for you to stay dedicated? What kept you dedicated? Um, you know, for me, I've, I've never been a quitter. And when I stopped, here's a funny, when I stopped playing baseball, I, I had, you know, I have standards and I played from 1990 to uh, 2000, end of the 2007 season. And I told myself that the only time I'll stop playing is when I suck and I'm not hitting good. And my last year that I, that I played, I battled back injuries and I wasn't, and that's not, for me, that's not an excuse. I don't, I don't think, I don't like excuses. I think there's always a way that you can perform regardless of how you're feeling. And I didn't, I didn't like the way I, I was hitting. And I said, that's it. I'm done. But I, but giving up or, you know, there's no way. I mean, I, I, for me, I just love the game so much that, that no matter what, what obstacles I had in the game, be it as a player, as a coach or whatever, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm in, I'm in for the long haul. Love it. You know, that, talk about mental toughness. And you and I were just talking about Michael Jordan and in the, in the series that, you know, TV series that was on, nine, I think it was nine series parts, you know, and talk about mental tough. I mean, Michael Jordan and you, you were actually, I think you met him a couple of times. Yep. Met him a few times. Actually, if you, if you, if you go back and, and, and watch episode six, the very beginning, you'll, you'll see me right next to uh, Jason Giambi. Um, we were actually there waiting for, for Michael to come out and, um, you know, because we were at the ball game. So when, you, when you're when – actually, when you're in major leagues, you get a little – you get a little more extra little perks. perks. You get the perks. So that was, <laughs> that was a really good thing right there. You know, it's interesting. He said that, you know, he's failed more times than he's been successful, and that's what made him great. He believes um, – and I love when I, when I hear that. Now, you've been at the big league level, minor league level, player, coach, everything – You've been around and you've managed, but you've been around some great managers along the way. Who were some of the really good ones and what are some of the things you picked up from them that made them that good? Oh, wow. I've had, I've had a lot of managers in my life. sort of was one of them, right? And it yeah. Tommy, Tommy, was a, Tommy was a motivator. Tommy was, a, you know, he was a, like a more of a cheerleader manager on the, on the field. I mean, he was – you know, he was rah. What you see on TV is exactly how he was in the dugout. You know, he was rah rah. You know, Tony Larusa. He was more. Um, he was more of a. Uh, he was really stern. You know, and then he evolved as the game started to evolve as well. You know, I had Buck Showalter, who was who was a tough manager, but you know, he was a good manager as well. Art Howe was was probably art how if he were managing right now he would fit in uh, unbelievably with the the way the players were because he he was more laid back he was probably the first i would say laid back manager that i had and that's the type of uh coaches that we have right now or managers we have now they're really you know kind of even keel you know they don't really get too too excited unless my buddy Ron Washington gets another uh, managing <laughs> job. And that, yeah, that's like a, that's like an extra player on, that's managing because he's, he's really, he's really fiery and uh, he loves, he, he's a cheerleader as well. You know, I've been lucky. I've um, been trying to get Ron on. I was, I was in Italy with Ron for a whole week. Right. And, you know, talk about a person who will never give up just like you. Oh. This guy's not giving up no matter what. He'll fight your tooth and nails to the end. And I really believe he needs to be back managing, no doubt about oh, it. Sure. Um, uh, just, you know, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Some of the things that you have changed, because you said evolved, you know, you manage, you know, you had to manage the Pan Am team. Talk right. about the top players in the USA, for, you know, that are pro players. But oh. some of the things that you made a change in your coaching or managing style? You know, I mean, for me, it's just, you know, learning to, to be a little bit more uh, patient. Because, you know, I was taught from, you know, coming up with the A's and we, I, we had some really tough coaches 
uh, Ron Plaza, who was, used to be with the uh, Cincinnati Reds, uh, Carl Keel, who was a um, longtime um, coach and farm director uh, before he passed. Um, those guys were extremely tough, and they would, you know, they would tell you, you know, go right, go left, and, you know, then you'll be there. You know, and today's player, you know, they would probably say, well, why can't I just go straight? <laughs> we didn't ask questions. And if they told us that was the route we needed to go, then that was the route we needed to go. I mean, it was – and that's what – and that's how I started out as a coach. And then, it, for me, it was, it was difficult to understand some of the players now because they were – they weren't taught the way older players were taught. You know, so you have to – you couldn't be you – you could be tough, but you couldn't be too tough because then – because the, some of the players would, you know, kind of shy away from you and wouldn't trust you. So that was probably the biggest um, thing I had to learn was to kind of tone it down a little bit. And, you know, just, you know, it, it made, me, made me realize just how tough I was. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's the thing. Sometimes we want to try to teach them how we played the game. And right. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work. Um, was there is there something that you do when it comes to discipline with a player if you run into a player that's you know you know we're all gonna have bad days right your, your bad days could come from being at home then you get to the park and he just doesn't seem like the same guy how do you deal with situations like that you know I mean you want to try to um, keep your personal life you know outside of the ballpark you know, and, and it's, very, it's very difficult at times. And, you know, for me, you just, you know, you just kind of, you feel like you're going to have a, a, an explosion or a meltdown, kind of, kind of back up a little bit and, 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 you know, take a moment and say, you know, is it really, is it really worth, you know, pissing this player off? Excuse my language. <laughs> uh, no, hey, it's a podcast. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> is it really worth it? you know, to, you know, ha get under this player's skin and, you know, because it's probably going to affect the way he's going to play that day. So I would say, you know, just, you know, trying to, trying to be a little bit more patient, try to, you know, take a, take a step back, you know, maybe, maybe even give yourself a, 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 a moment for, you know, just kind of reflect on, you know, how you want to be treated. And I think that would probably help. What's your routine as a manager? You have a routine, you know, you get to the park, are there certain things you do to prepare the team, you know, to understand what's going on that day? Uh, kind of a routine for our coaches out there who also are working with players in games, before games. Well, my routine usually started the night before, you know, and now you're seeing, you know, that it's starting to uh, be a, like an everyday thing now. So now players, before they even um, before they even go home, they they know that they're playing the next day. And I usually, and I would tell guys, especially some of my bench players, okay, you're going to play tomorrow. You know, even if I hadn't posted the lineup, so I would I would suggest you know letting the guys know that they're going to play the next day, or you know posting the lineup for the next day um, before you leave the ballpark. You know, and I as I. I usually make the schedule for the next day uh, prior to prior to leaving, you know, and just because the players they want to know, you know, what they're doing. They they need us. They need a schedule, and they need to know that that you're going to put a schedule together and and to help them. So because they, you know, no one likes to ha have questions about what's going on, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I want to make sure that I did. I put a schedule. This is what time we're going to be stretching. This is time we're going to do early work. This is the time we're going to do batting practice. The time we're going to do infield practice. And you line it all up. You know, you, most of the time I would I would go from game time up, opposed to going from from the time I get to the ballpark to the time we go on the field. Because you know, I I just that's how I like to work. So I mean, you develop your own your own style, but give the guys, you know, notice and you know, let them know that they're going to play um, prior to the, 
you know, the night, the night before the game's going to start. Did you have uh, post meetings or, or, or meetings after the games, or did you wait for the next day? No, I mean, most of the time, unless something, something really happened bad or we were, we were struggling or something, um, no, I tried to, you know, let the guys, you know, process the game and then go over it the next day. You know, sometimes that's, and that, and I, it was kind of funny is that I should have used that with my son a lot. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> riding home with me after a ball game in high school was probably not good. Like, why did you do this? Why did you do that? That's probably not the best thing. Please, please, guys, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and we talked about that yesterday with some high school coaches because we asked, you know, that ride home for some kids could be the most, you know, oh. That's the thing in the world. Yeah. And it's tough for parents, right? You're a dad, you know, and yet you teach coaches. And you, right. and you know, I mean, but it's even hard because you're trying to help them. So talk yeah. about that. What would you do different? I would, I would, for me, for as a, as a coach or dad, and we're, I'm riding home with my son, I would probably, you know, I would probably try to stay away from the game for a little while just to let him process it. But, you have to know my son. If I'm too quiet, then he'll then he'll say I'm passive aggressive. And then if I say something, then he, <laughs> then he'll say, "Why are you why are you upset?" And I was like, I, then I'm trying to figure out how we're gonna do this. So, yeah. Hey, just, let's uh, take, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, just I would say just um, you know try and hit on some good points for the game. You know, right away, just you know, hey, nice job. You know, nice job backing up second base or or, you know, great throw from the outfield or whatever. If they didn't, they didn't hit the ball very well during the game, you know, maybe try to stay away from that, you know, try to touch on all the positive stuff. And then maybe, maybe later after dinner or after, you know, you grab something to eat, then you say, and you might want to talk about, you know, some of the bad stuff and, you know, how we can get better. Well said, you know, and I think people forget it. There's always positives in a game. You could have stole a base. You could have dove mm -hmm. the ball and knocked it down, saved a run. I mean, there's so many things you could figure out that are good. Uh, the, the old joke is just send them home with mom because mom will be yeah. a little bit more sympathetic. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to take a question here. And you may address this, but you may add to it because you may have addressed it already. What, what attitude did you learn from the managers that you were with? Uh, what direction did the managers go with the players? Um, what was the most they emphasized? Um, for me, it was it was more of intensity. Um, I was, I mean, I had a lot of friends in baseball, but I would never, ever, and I think I probably learned this from my college coach uh, more than anything, is, you know, before the game, if you didn't have the same uniform on as I did, I didn't talk to you, even if I knew you. You know, I'll, you know, we can go grab a bite or a drink or something after the game. But during the game, you know, if you're, if you're my buddy and you're pitching, you know, I'm, tr I'm trying to take you deep. If you're my buddy and you're at, you're at second base or shortstop and I'm trying, and I'm trying to break up two, you better learn how to jump out of the way because I'm coming in hard. Mm. You know, a, uh, I was thinking when you said lineups early, and I should have asked this, um, has Ernie Young changed how he, makes lineups you know the old traditional way is one way um and you're scouting too and remember in scout and not that, that i want to jump but in scouting you know that's kind of changed also some of the tradition maybe we'll get into that but right. as far as lineups have you changed how you make a lineup no i don't know i just you know you, you look at you know for me i kind of want my my best hitter to get more at bats mm. you know so i kind of adjust it that way as well yeah. You know, not so much, um, you know, just because he's fast doesn't mean that he needs to lead off. You know, I would rather have, you know, my better hitters at the, the top of the order, hmm. you know, and then go from there. I mean, you for me, I start, always start with the with the middle of my order, my three, four, five, six guys. I put those guys in, in, a, in an order and then – and then I then I'll figure out who's one, two, seven, eight, nine. You know, 
you know, if I have some speed or I have some guys that can handle the bat, if I, if I know one of my players is better, better handling the bat, you know, I'm going to put them in a two hole. If I, you know, I would like not to try and bunch guys that, that don't have speed together, you know, and that, that's one of my, one of my things I try to do. And then obviously, you know, try to get some, uh, some balance in your lineup. If, you know, if you, just because you have, just because you have left-handers, a bunch of lefties and righties, doesn't mean that you have to go right, left, right, left, or, you know, whatever you can, you know, you might have a couple righties in a row and that lefty may be better suited to bat six than he, than he will be to bat fourth. Absolutely. You know, and, and I always thought, you know, I think something I've always wondered is, you know, why somebody needs to be second, needs to be a good bunner, because I'm wondering, are you going to bunt in the first inning? Right. Maybe, you, maybe you need him, but, you know, how many times does he come up in the order that he's going to be second in the order again to bunt? Right. Uh, so things like that, I guess, you know, and it's good to think that way, right? To think outside, yeah. I call that think outside the box a little bit. Yeah. Um, what about batting practice um, or any routines prior to games? Have you made any changes there or pretty traditional? You know, I'm pretty, for me, I'm still, I'm still old school as far as, and that's a bad word. Yeah, right. In, today, in today's <laughs> baseball game, because, you know, when you say old school, you know, you know, some of the new age guys, they, you know, kind of turn their nose up at you. But I'm, I'm more traditional, I would say. You know, first round, if we're doing batting practice on the field, I, I typically don't like to do situations uh, the first round of batting practice because my guys aren't loose yet. You know, you're going to get in the batting cage and you're going to tell them, okay, one bunt or two bunts, and we're going to do hit and run, and we're going to move the runner, and we're going to get them in. You know, infield's back, infield's in, and we're going to squeeze. Okay, they're not ready. They're not loose to, to do a situation. So so instead of doing that, you know, how about, you know, what, you got seven swings. You're going to bunt two times. You got seven swings. We want to stay up the middle of the other way first round. So now they're, they're getting in the habit of, you know, using their hands, letting the ball travel, you know, and maybe the second round. Okay, we're going to go uh, hit and run. Okay, and we're going to move the runner. Okay, we're going to go infield in, infield back, you know, and maybe a squeeze or maybe after that, maybe three swings. You know, I, I think that plan is a little bit better, you know, and then now they're loose and then you probably have maybe five or six minutes left and then they, you know, you want them to start driving the ball gap to gap. Hey, we're going to take a question here and then we're going to come back to managing, but uh, th this is going to be put your uh, scouting hat on, it sounds. It says, Ernie, yesterday I read an article from MLB about which is the best baseball state. Um, he wants to know. Uh, I saw that. Victor, Victor wants to know your opinion, and obviously football, he, he references football. But, you know, I, I'm just going to jump in real quick. I just want people to know Illinois is always like in the top three or four in the draft. Uh, a lot of great players. <laughs> people forget because they think it's a cold weather place, right? Right. So I did see that same article, and I think it had – I think Ohio was up there. I'm sure Texas was up there in the top five. Florida. Now, are we talking football it. or baseball? Baseball. Talking baseball. baseball. I, gotcha. saw, I saw that article, and I, I think I got three out of five. Was uh, Illinois in there? Nope. Wow. Nope. So I know Texas. I think uh, – I want to say maybe Georgia, somewhere in the south. But um, – yeah, I don't know why Illinois is not in there. I mean, it, you know, I think more because we don't play year round. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, I think that's a big, a big deal. But also in saying that, I mean, if you look at, you know, for me personally, I would rather have a guy from the Midwest pitching wise that didn't pitch a lot. Mm -hmm. so I know he's got a lot of bullets left. I mean, it's hard to draft guys or even, you know, a lot of guys you know, from here in Arizona where you're, you're constantly playing or constantly pitching. I mean, at some point, you know, you're going to, you're going to run into some trouble. Now hitters, we don't, you don't see in the Midwest, you don't see, you know, hitters don't get a chance to see the, the extreme velocity. And those guys, the velocity pitchers are in Texas, they're in Florida, you know, they're in warm climate areas. Yeah. So, I mean, no, go ahead. No. So you look at, you know, we had, we had how many? We have we had two Chicago kids that got drafted in the first day. Mm -hmm. you know, a kid from Mount Carmel and a kid from De La Salle, pitcher, pitcher from De La Salle. So, you know that 
that's, and that's, by the way, both South Side schools in Chicago. Yeah. So that's, a, that's a unbelievable accomplishment, I think, as far as, um, you know, how players are, are starting to get a little bit better. I'd like to see, obviously, more players in the city of Chicago, and then maybe we can crack that, that, top, that top five list. Absolutely, you know, and a, and a shout out. I know I'm going to miss people, but we, you know, the friends of ours here, and I know you know Marvin Freeman, Luke Collier, all those guys. Yeah, all my buddies. The, yeah. the ACE, the ACE program. Yeah. They almost need to package that program that they're doing in, with the inner city kids, because you know, and put it in every state because yeah. we would get so. You know, don't forget. What about all the players on Michigan State? I think it was in a College World Series. University of Michigan. University, University of Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, I mean, what, so they've done a great job, and I, and on that point. I want to ask you, the way the game's going from the younger levels, the development aspects, what would, you, what would you like to see done better? You know, less games, more games, more practices. What, 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 where should we be heading? I think, I think we need to see more practices. I think, uh, I think they need to uh, understand the fundamentals a little bit more, you know, where they need to be. Because when I go to a ball game right now, and, you know, I just started scouting, um, but, you know, I saw a lot of high school games and I've been more pro side. So I, I don't get a chance to see a lot of amateur stuff unless I'm watching, you know, my son play or something like that. And and my biggest pet peeve is is players, younger players that don't know where they need to be on certain plays, be it, you know, uh, cutoffs or you know, just a routine bunt plays or and that's, and I think that that's an issue with uh, development. So, and I think if players are able to understand the fundamentals a little bit better, they stand out even more when a scout is at the game because the first thing the scout's going to say, oh my God, I can't believe that kid's in, a, in that right position. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. I mean, you know, I, you know, I had to, you know, and I've always taught my son from the professional aspect of, you know, where he needs to be. He's played third, he's played first, he's settled in a little bit at first base, you know, trying to explain to him, you know, just, you know, certain scenarios and he should know. And my other thing too, each player on the field should know where the other person should be. Doesn't matter if you're a shortstop or second base or left field or right field, you should know where everyone is supposed to be on the field in any given play. And folks, just so you know, we got about 10 more minutes and we're going to stay on schedule because I know Ernie has a, uh, another zoom call um, at the top of the hour. So uh, Ernie, uh, what's the toughest thing about managing? Toughest thing about managing is uh, managing today's players. I would say managing, you know, how, how to communicate with today's player. You know, you know, if you're, if you're too tough, will they shy away from you? If you, you know, if you're too easy, will they take advantage of you? You know, I, w I would say it's, that would, that's probably be the toughest thing as a, as a manager. I think, um, you know, cause I had, man, I, I managed uh, Nick Castellanos, you know, when he was with the Tigers and he, he was playing third base at the time. And I was like, Oh my God, this, this kid's, this kid's killing me. You know, he, we work and work and work on early work. And he, you know, he'd be at third base, you know, <laughs> even with the bag, there's no count, you know, then that hitter gets two strikes on him and he's still playing in for the bunt. And I was like, Oh my God, he's killing me, man. Nick, we move back. <laughs> so but I love that kid. I mean, he worked, he worked so hard and I was extremely tough on him, but you know, at times I had to put my arm around him and say, hey, you know what, you're going to be a major leaguer and you know, you need to know this. I mean, I, I can't keep telling you, you know, where you need to be all the time. You're going to have to learn how to do it on your own. Well said, man. Um, what's on a young, during a game, you're managing ball game. And I know team USA is different. It's a, it's a shorter tournament compared to the minors or, or Major League Baseball. But what, what's your thought process during games, while the actual game's going on? Trying to stay uh, ahead of uh, what's going on, trying to be two or three 
maybe four pitches ahead of, of where I need to be. So, you know, if I'm thinking about, you know, a possible steal situation, if I'm thinking about a possible hit and run situation, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, try to, you know, play scenarios in my head, you know, okay, if this count happens then that, if, you know, you know, if this, if this happens, then I'll, I'll do that. So I, I try to figure out, um, you know, obviously, you know, where I'm at in the lineup. And I would really rely when I was managing team, I really rely on my coaches because mm -hmm. as a manager, you know, you can't do it all. You have to, you have to have help. And if you, if you don't get the help from your coach, you don't allow your coaches to help, then it's your, your team's going to be, your team's not going to be very good. So you, and, and, and listen to your coaches, you know, if your coach, you know, or hitting coach comes up to you and say, Hey, I think, you know, so it's okay. Obviously you have the final decision, but you know, if, you know, if obviously if they really feel that strongly about something, you know, you really have to consider it because, you know, you have to rely on them. Ernie, you know, one of the questions that comes up all the time, and, and the Marco Mendoza here asks, he asks, what's your philosophy on pitching in terms of development? But I'm going to add this a little bit. You hear this a lot. In order to be a good manager, you've got to understand pitching and pitchers and managing pitchers. Talk about that a little bit, too. So for me, like uh, when I was managing, we, I really wanted to make sure I had a grasp on the, um, on the running game, you know, when, because, you know, that was for me, that was, uh, I love to try and figure out or try and get into the head of, get into the head of, um, of the other um, manager to try and figure out, you know, okay, this is a good running count. Okay. Now, now what? Okay. So, so my pitcher, you know what, maybe I'll call a slide step or maybe I'll, you know, I'll call a pick over. Maybe I'll, I'll call a, you know, come set and hold the ball, you know, just to try and disrupt, you know, the base runner and as, as well as trying to disrupt the timing of, uh, of the batter and to give us, to give, to give, uh, to give everybody a chance to, um, to get, you know, get the job done. You know, one of the things managing, it seems like, and I want to talk, talk to the younger coaches, younger managers, you're going to make decisions just like players. And sometimes you make a decision because an example, you know, you're pitching a guy away, your defense might, you know, play away and you move them, but yet the pitcher misses and that guy pulls the ball down left field line. Everybody wonders why you moved them to the right side. <laughs> In your mind, you're thinking that possibly as a young coach too, that I make a mistake. How do you deal with the mental aspect of that? Because, you know, everybody's looking at you. Hey, did right. you make that call? <laughs> Well, I mean, you can't. This is a game of failure. I mean, obviously, it'd be a, in a perfect world, you know, the pitcher would hit the spot. They they hit a nice ground ball to second base. You know, we'll be out of the end. But you know, that's that's not the case. I mean, sometimes the hitter is better than the pitcher on a given pitch, or the swing's better than the pitch. You know, it could be a good pitch and the swing's better. You know, so yeah. you, so you, I mean, you you can't you can't second guess yourself. I mean, you, I mean, obviously, you want to be able to, yeah. Um, put your players in the right position to be successful. I mean, now, you know, you look at all the, you know, defensive alignments with the over shifts and even the, even the hitters, they're not going out of their, their, um, their setup. If they're dead pool, they're going to continue. They're going to stay dead pool. They're not going to try to change and hit the ball the other way just to get a hit. They're going to try and beat the shift. You know, for me, that would never happen because I'm going to hit it or try to hit it or attempt to hit it. Well, you're not, because <laughs> I want to get on the base. <laughs> Absolutely. And, but, you know, and that's one of the questions that comes up, even by fans. They wonder, you know, the guy, they're shifting them. Why can't the guy just hit the ball the other way? But it's right. easier said than done. you got to train right. for that, too. Yes, you do. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's, and that's part of your, your pregame routine is, is learn how to, to, to handle the bat. And, you know, at times you have to know how to uh, manipulate the bat, uh, uh, you know, i.e. Wade Boggs or Tony Gwynn or Derek Jeter, you know, who were extremely masterful at, at pulling those hands in and, and shooting the ball the other way. Um, we got about five minutes left, so let's, let's put the scouting hat on. Talk to the coaches about 
what you're looking for in players nowadays? Not, not necessarily always the skills, but also other things. Well, for me, I, for me, I, I like, I mean, cause I don't see a lot of amateur guys unless I, I'm doing some, you know, stuff with team USA with the, with the younger players or even, um, you know, out of the country with you guys, you know, for me, the first thing I look is if he passes the eye test, you know, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, the player walks out on the field, he looks like a ball player, you know, his pant, his shirt's tucked in, his belt's on, his, you know, he looks like a baseball player. So I'm looking, I'm looking for the eye test first. And then if a player passes the eye test, and then now I start to, to look at, you know, everything else, you know, how, how he's running, how he's warming up. And then I go from there to, you know, if they're taking batting practice and, and see, you know, how he's handling the bat. And then, I mean, it's a continued process. Then, you know, obviously the game starts. And I'm looking at, is he a good teammate? Okay, did he just strike out with the bases loaded and slam his helmet or, you know, win the dugout and, you know, put his head down or, or did he strike out with the bases loaded and got back up on the top step to cheer for his teammate to pick him up? You know, those are all important things. Or, or did he, you know, he make him, he struck, he struck out and, and instead of uh, running the glove out to, you know, the, the runner that was at second base or first base, did he just run out in the field and not, you know, not take the glove out to one of the other players. I mean, all that stuff is important. And believe it or not, every amateur scout is probably looking at that and, and making notes and seeing which player is a, um, a possible, you know, player. And that's one of them. Hey, Gavin Bennett uh, on Facebook says, uh, he's putting the pressure on you. He says, what would you think about the players in South Africa? You know, we didn't see all the players, obviously. We had dealt with the coaches also. Uh, I mean, I, you know what? I wish I had an opportunity to see more players. I mean, maybe next time we go there, we'll, we'll get a, 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 a bigger group of players. But, you know, just like anything, you got to teach. You got to grow the game. And they, you know, they have to – you have to keep practicing. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You know, and I love you say that because I think that's what we're getting away from a little bit at the grassroots level. And in the long term, it's going to hurt the game a lot if we don't readjust practicing more sometimes than we just play all the time. Um, let's finish it with this. Advice to coaches. Um, any last minute advice, you know, that you want to give young coaches when they're getting in the coaching that can help them just be, you know, better coach, better player, better manager? Um, I would say definitely uh, study the game, know the ins and outs from, from defensive alignments, you know, because there's a lot of things that you can teach and, and teaching, teaching that's going to help you be a better player. Look at, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of drills that you can look on, on YouTube from major league coaches, uh, Ron Washington in particular, Bobby hey, Dickerson, great. He's got Bobby great Dickerson, ones. they got great 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 defensive uh, drills and make your players understand the importance of, of playing good defense because you know no matter what you gotta get three outs where you can hit and you get three outs you can hit the quicker you get three outs the more you get to hit so stress that so and that's the only way you're going to stress that is is uh through defense all right, super. Ernie Young, man, I can't thank you enough. I know you got another Zoom to get to. Yeah. <laughs> so God bless you, man. Best of the family. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, brother. Okay. All right, man. That's Ernie Young. I'm Pete Caliendo, and I want to thank Brian Crock, our producer with the Lineup Media Group, and also thank everybody in the U.S. and around the world for joining the show. Thank you, Ernie Young. Thank you to everybody on Twitter, Facebook, and Zoom. Remember, this is the show that loves to interview baseball's greatest coaching minds. And remember, tomorrow, 1 p.m., we're back in division with Slow the Game Down. Uh, Ryan Harrison will join us. You do not want to miss that. Slow the Game Down. Learn about how the brain works, how the mind works, how the vision works to make yourself better, not only as a player, but as a coach also. So, again, I'm your host, Pete Caliendo, the show that loves interview baseball's best coaching minds in the U.S. and around the world. We'll see you on tomorrow's show, 1 p.m. Bye-bye, everybody.